what has happened in Ukraine is quite remarkable. It's a, it's a demonstration of the rapidity with which the people's will will be uh, heard or felt uh, in today's society. And I think the, 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 the rapidity with which it has moved should, frankly, be a message to Russia. And uh, Mr. Putin should listen carefully to Ukrainians who have voiced their desire for change. That's number one. Number two, uh, the, the President Putin, in a telephone conversation with President Obama just the other day, committed to respect the territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. And I think that's incredibly important. All right. Well, maybe, maybe not. Welcome back to the C. Molesberg Show. Uh, that was John Kerry, of course, uh, and joining us now to talk about that and his brand new book, Churchill's First War, Young Winston at War with the Afghans, is uh, Con Coughlin. And, of course, he is a um, foreign editor um, at uh, the uh, London uh, uh, Daily Telegraph, also a foreign policy expert, terrorism expert, Middle East expert. Hello, Con. Good to be with you, Steve. How, did I get enough experts in there for you? <laughs> oh, just enough. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, now, in addition to what Kerry said, <clears throat> we, we had Chuck Hagel today um, telling Russia, that, or urging Russia, I guess is the word they're using, uh, not to take any action on Ukraine that might boost tensions or be subject to misinterpretation. Of course, now we have reports Russia is massing uh, uh, military exercises on the border with Ukraine. Um, they're harboring the uh, former president who claims he's still president of Ukraine. Where are we headed with this? Well, I think we've got quite a major crisis brewing in Europe between the West and Ukraine. I mean, clearly the Ukrainian people had had quite enough of their, of their pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, who now seems to have fled to Moscow. But um, all, the, all the political turmoil that has caused has prompted the Russians to decide that um, they need to mobilize military, militarily because they believe that they have a lot of assets in Ukraine, most notably the Black Sea naval base at Sebastopol in the Crimea, but also millions of ethnic Russians um, who tend to inhabit the eastern provinces of Ukraine, and, and the Russians seem fairly keen to protect them. So if they take any, any precipitate action, that is going to put them on a collision course with the West. Well, and of course, uh, in addition to everything you just mentioned and that we talked about at the top, we, we have a, a group of armed men seizing the, uh, the government headquarters and parliament uh, building today in Ukraine, and, uh, and they uh, raised the, uh, the Russian flag. What, what's the significance of that? Well, th this happened in the Crimea, where, where, where there are a lot of Russia, ethnic Russians, Russian passport holders. And nobody knows precisely the identity of the, the people who right. seize control of the local regional parliament. But, you know, there's, there's, a, there's quite a you know, good suspicion that these people are acting on the orders of Moscow. I mean, the, the, the Russians are very good at using... Uh, agent provocateur to, right. to stir up trouble, and this this is a classic tactic. Um, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the next thing they do is invite the Russian army in to <laughs> save them from uh, Ukrainian nationalists. And, and and what would what can the U.S. do? I mean, and 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 I'll tell you, Obama certainly with everything he's done foreign policy wise, no one's afraid of him, especially let alone Putin. Uh, but but uh, you know the the red line on Syria, uh, the threats he made there certainly didn't and help uh, any credibility that he might have had. So if Russia does what you say they might do, what do we do? Well, as you said, I think you know, Obama's become the emperor who's got no clothes. I mean, people see right through him. And when it comes to sort of standing up for international security issues, you fear that people aren't listening to him. As, as you said, both Chuck Hadle uh, and John Kerry have made it very clear they want to see Ukraine's sovereign integrity protected and not violated by the Russians. But if the Russians were to do that, you just wonder what, what America and its Western allies would do by way of retaliation. I certainly don't see the prospect, and I blogged on this today, I don't 
don't see the prospect of, 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 of NATO or the West uh, initiating military action against the Russians. I don't think they want a war with Russia. And I, and I think also there are options for imposing economic sanctions on liberty because most of Europe relies very heavily on Russia, on Russia for its energy, energy yeah. supply. So, you know, the West has got itself in quite a fix over this. And one more before we get to the book, and that is uh, the Russian warship in Havana. What's the, what do you see as the significance of that? Well, that's just, that's just an irritation. I mean, one of Putin's great sort of uh, tactics is to just, just irritate people, and nothing is more likely to irritate uh, Washington and the American people than the you know, Russian warship in Cuba. Yeah, okay. Um, let's move on to the book, Churchill's First War, Young Winston at War with the Afghans. Con Coughlin is the author. Uh, so what made you undertake this uh, piece of work? Well, basically, I was, you know, I've been covering the, the, the recent Afghan mission for the last few years. In fact, I covered the, the, the Soviet invasion many years ago, so I um, you know, followed Afghanistan for many years. And when I was interviewing uh, General David Petraeus, he pointed out that you know, when, he, when he was devising his plan to deal with the Taliban, he was rereading Winston Churchill's account of his war, uh, his first war, hence the title of the book, fighting the great great grandfathers of the Taliban in the 1890s. And it's just amazing, Steve, how history repeats itself. There was Churchill at the age of 22 fighting um, the very same people that we are fighting today, and it seems that no lessons have been learned. Yeah, and, and, and why is that? I mean, we, we, we fought though the, you know, the very same people, uh, we're fighting them now, as you said, Russia went in there and, and, and fought the very same people that, that we're now fighting, and now, as you say, we're fighting them now, and, and along with our, our allies, so why, has, why hasn't uh, any of our, these countries learned from, from history? Well, I, I think people dive into these conflicts without, without giving proper consideration of what's gone before. And it's only one, when they're in the middle of, of a war, they suddenly pick up the history books and say, oh, my God, is it really like this? And, and certainly General Petraeus, who was a very thoughtful soldier um, and was brought in basically to turn the mission around um, four or five years ago now. And so he, 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 he wanted to educate himself, and he went right back to basics. And as I said, he thought that Churchill's experiences in the 1890s were... Uh, had resonance, were valid for today's conflict. Um, and, and so, as I said, when he was working out how to deal with the Taliban, he was sort of trying to learn the lessons that Churchill um, wrote about uh, more than 100 years ago. How did, how did uh, fighting in that war, how did that shape uh, the man or, or shape the young man into the man we came to know uh, and we study in history uh, as Winston Churchill? Well, Winston Churchill was a very young uh, officer in the British Army. He was a second lieutenant in a cavalry regiment. He was straight out of military academy. And like a lot of young men of, of that age, he had a very, gung a very gung ho attitude. Uh, one of Churchill's finest quotations comes from that period uh, when he said, uh, nothing is more exhilarating in life than to be shot at without result, uh, which shows you just how gung-ho he was. But after six weeks of very bitter fighting, when some of his very close colleagues were, were cut down standing virtually by his side, he came to have a very different understanding of the horrific nature of modern warfare. And one of, my, my, one of the points I make in the book is that this helped to form his approach as a war leader in many years to come when sometimes much to the American commander's uh, frustration during the Second World War, he wouldn't, he wouldn't authorize any action where he thought there would be unnecessary casualties. He was very much aware of just what a bloody, bloody and messy business war is. Yeah, well, it's all in here, folks. Uh, a great education on, on the man uh, who was so significant, of course, uh, in, in our history, in the history of the world. Churchill's first war, young Winston at war with the Afghans, Con Coughlin. And, uh, Con, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, sir.
Great pleasure to be with you, Steve. My pleasure. All Thank best. you. Okay. All right, folks, when we come back, uh, Kendall Coffey and I go uh, spinning the law. Lots to talk about, including yesterday's decision uh, by a court that uh, said that Texas's uh, um, uh, constitution, their definition of marriage uh, between uh, a man and a woman as marriage uh, and not, you know, allowing gays to marry is unconstitutional. So here we go again, another example of the will of the people being overturned by the courts. What's, what rights do the states have when it comes to, to this and other issues? We'll talk about it with Kendall. We'll also weigh in on Jan Brewer's decision and what that law would have done. Uh, many other interesting cases as well. Uh, when we return on the Steve Malzberg Show on Newsmax Television. The Steve Malzberg Show.